In today's Conquering Codependency, God's Way, we are making our way through our series on shame. Today is the third message in our series. And if you are interested in watching all of the messages, simply subscribe to our YouTube channel or our podcast. Secondly, especially for my beloved YouTube family, love you guys. If you have any questions on today's message or about shame in general, leave them in the comments section below. And next week I'll be hosting a live Q&A where I will answer your questions right on YouTube. And then finally, I've written a workbook called So Long to Shame that has corresponding materials to go along with each teaching message. If you are interested in gaining access to those materials to help you process through shame so that you can soar along with other great resources that you can use to help you conquer codependency God's way, you can gain access to those by joining the Treasured Tribe. Visit www.treasuredtribe.com. And now on to today's show. Hi there, I'm Eileen Thompson, founder of Treasured Ministries. Welcome to our podcast and YouTube channel where we talk about conquering codependency God's way. You know, for years, I was unaware of my codependency struggle because it flew right under the radar of my confused Christianity and controlling tendencies to find love. But when God brought an awareness and an unraveling of codependency that would open my arms to real intimacy with Him, everything changed. Now, I'm not a psychologist or a therapist. Don't expect an expert on this channel. I don't even have a seminary degree. But I am a woman that found freedom from codependency through God dependency. And now I'm passionate about sharing this with others. So join me as we discover truth, experience freedom, and live treasured. Hey there, I am so excited to see you again and just so excited most of all that you and I are just telling the enemy to jump. You know, shame is Satan's calling card, but inside of the Word of God, God has an antidote for shame that will work every single time. And because this antidote is a lasting solution and does not rest on your power, but on God's almighty power, it is superior to your self-reliance or anything the world could ever bring us to conquer shame. And shame is important for you and I to confront. And it's important because shame gets in the way to God's cure for codependency. The cure to codependency God's way is that daily intimacy, God dependency with him and shame prevents us uh, from pressing into God. And not only does shame prevent us from pressing into God, not because God leaves us, but because we hide from him and feel unworthy of love, it also prevents us from real intimacy with others and becoming the woman that God created us to be. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about addressing the specific lie from shame that says, I am not enough and introducing you to God's solutions, his timeless truths that will help you to conquer shame. And inside of my life, I use many of my own solutions and they had a temporary effect, but I'm here to tell you that God's principles are timeless and they can tackle shame. Do I still feel shame? Yes, we live in a broken world and the enemy is here to attack, but now I've got God's anti-venom for Satan's shame bite. And you, when you finish this series, will be armed with that too. 
And so today I want to talk to you about this message that just that drumbeat in our head that says, I am not enough. Where does that shame message come from? The first place that it comes from are the measurements that we use, the standards that we decide uh, of, of how we're going to measure our worth and value. You see, all of us are born into this world with this lingering question, do I matter? Do I measure up? And we get these measurements uh, from outside of ourselves. We can gain them from the culture inside of our world. We can gain them from our family culture that we, that we marinated in growing up. It could be through messages that we hear on TV from marketing companies that let me just tell you could care less about you of how you should measure up. It could be be expectations that other people have placed upon you. It could be expectations that you have placed upon yourself. But these measurements will always make you feel like you have fallen short. That's the first way. The second way is wounds from others. When other people wound you, when they hurt you, the wound in and of itself was horrible. It is awful. But what Satan does is what I call the one-two punch. He not only, Ephesians 6 tells us, works through people to wound us, but then he will use the wound to package a wounding message, a lie from him that will send straight into our heart. And this message that comes from the wound can come many different ways. It can come from words spoken directly over us. It can come from indirect things uh, said about us, passive aggressive comments, but words can also be packaged inside actions done to us. And all of a sudden, it's not just the wound that we're carrying, it's the message that the wound sent. Maybe something like, I'm not worth fighting for, <laughs> or I must be really stupid, or I'm so selfish. I can't tell you the number of women I've talked to where their mothers told them they were selfish. And that hurt, but they are carrying this selfish message throughout their life and they, it's been tied to their heart. And so because of that, shame continues to speak inside of the silence. And then the third thing is lesser gods than our great God. You know, sometimes we will shoulder shame that is not our responsibility. When others wound us, we will shoulder that shame. Sometimes we will shoulder shame, right, from measurements that God has never called us to live up to. But then there's a shame that comes. When you and I run after lesser gods, all sin is a result of running after lesser gods. But let me tell you something. God has a solution for that too. You see, God is after your heart and he wants to free you. And he provides a solution for us even when we've blown it. When I knew after my codependency crash, when I was made aware, oh my goodness, this is the result of me looking to somebody else to get my worth. I'm going to tell you something. Just like we learned last week, in the light in my coming to God and saying, I need help, God's love met me there. And it not only met me there, but it equipped me to use when I ran after my lesser gods to build an entire ministry out of that 
experience. Let me tell you something. Yes, shame is Satan's tool to shame you, to prevent you from becoming all that God has created you to be, to tell you to take on those messages when you were wounded, to get you to run after what the culture tells you to chase that will always answer you with this message. You are not enough, but God has a solution and his solution will set you free. In the beginning of this series, I talked about the fact that you and I were going to address the three lies of shame. Today, we're focusing on the lie of I am not enough. And we're going to use that by looking at a story about two wildflowers in the Bible, Mary and Martha, from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And we're going to see the truth as we consider wildflowers and how we confront shame that wildflowers confidently confront any stones in their way. In fact, they press through them and through that they become stronger because of it. Why? Because they know that it's all a part of growth. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Isn't it interesting that Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, but not into her heart? Mary was sitting there at the feet of Jesus, being intimate with him. And this was bold intimacy because back then women were not taught by rabbis. The very fact that she was sitting at his feet was bold intimacy. And while Martha welcomed Jesus into her home, she didn't welcome Jesus into her heart. And many times as believers, I know for me for years, I welcomed Jesus into my home when I received him as my Lord and Savior, but not into my heart. And often when this happens, when we fail to give God our whole heart, shame is in the way. Shame prevents us from enjoying a rich relationship uh, with, with God and others. Shame prevented Martha from sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha did not want to do that. Why? There were several reasons I see here is that Martha chose to serve her standards, the cultural standards, instead of sit with Jesus. You see, back then, there was a cultural standard about hospitality. People would travel, they would walk around, and if somebody came to your door and you did not offer hospitality, it was considered shameful to turn them away. And so Martha was living up to that cultural standard that she had to offer hospitality. That is what she was serving. And in and of itself, that's not a bad thing. But when it becomes first, when we don't seek Jesus first, when it gets in the way, of our feelings of worthiness of love so we're not like Mary and rushing at the feet of Jesus. It's a problem. And many times, many times you and I have been living under measurements before we came to Christ and they were good. Good cultural measurements, right? Like hospitality 
Or maybe it is the, America, the standard of the American dream. Or perhaps it is religious rules that you lived by forever. Maybe it's a life of church activity. Maybe it's a certain standard, how much time you're going to spend in your quiet time. Maybe it is the culture inside of your family upbringing. And maybe that was toxic. Maybe it wasn't. But all these measurements are driving, driving, driving when Jesus isn't first. And see, back then... <laughs> Jesus came to set people free and he comes to set us free because when we come to Christ, those standards fade away. We now live for the standard of holy righteousness and you know what? Jesus did that for us in his faithfulness all the way to Calvary. And when we put our trust in him, the Bible says that we rest under his righteousness. What measurements from the world or standards are you trying to keep that is causing you shame? It prevents us from enjoying that relationship with God. What are standards speaking to you that God is not calling you to live up to. The other thing that I want you to see is that when we don't confront this shame, we will carry it to others. We will carry it to others. When you and I are holding on to these standards, we need other people to line up to them. And that's why Martha came to Jesus and she said, don't you care that, that my sister has left me to do all this work all by myself, right? Right? In other words, implying my sister is lazy. She is not holding up her end of the bargain, right? When we carry shame, we will carry it also to others. And that's why it's so important for us to confront it. I want you to see something beautiful, beautiful that Jesus did because the other place of shame that can come because Mary was sitting there, right? And I am sure that Martha said it just loud enough for her sister to hear. And Mary had a choice in that moment. She could have believed the passive aggressive comments from Martha that told her she was lazy, that told her she was wrong for sitting at the feet of Jesus, that told her she wasn't worthy of that love. But Mary chose instead to entrust herself to God's words spoken over us. When others throw stones at us through words or their actions or whatever it may be, we have an opportunity to trust the words of Jesus over us. And Jesus comes to defend Mary. He says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Jesus, in his tender way, shines a light on Mary's fact that she did not have to live up to these standards anymore. Thing. Jesus provides gentle correction to Martha and to us to point us to a greater joy. The Holy Spirit will convict us of sin, not to put more shame on us, but to free us from its shackles because we are bound to what we bow down to. What is God's solution for this shame. If you are watching this inside of the Treasure Tribe, I've created a work, but workbook for you and it may take you a whole week to process this, but it is going to walk you through where you are going to spend time with God and ask God about the standards that you're trying to measure yourself with and then walk through an exercise of letting those go through prayer 
we're going to come into God's presence and we're going to ask him, Lord, what is the message that I'm believing from my heart? And the answer to that is for you to forgive your offender. And when you forgive your offender, make no mistake about it because the enemy loves to confuse forgiveness. He will confuse forgiveness by telling you uh, forgiveness means you can't set boundaries. You have to be the best friend of that person. And again, you can't try. Listen, listen, forgiveness is about you, your freedom, untying yourself from that shaming message from the person. That is what forgiveness is about. And that's why in our YouTube channel and in the Treasure Tribe, we have that series on what does it mean to forgive? But I'm going to tell you something. You deserve to be free. And the wound that you've experienced, it not only hurt you, but then Satan did his one-two punch. He took that wound and then he twisted a message around it and just put it inside of your heart. And then his third uh, punch that he throws, it's a right, left, right jab. The third punch that he throws is he confuses, he confuses the concept of forgiveness because he doesn't want you to be free. You forgive your offender and when you do, you untie yourself from that message. And the third thing is this. You come into God's presence and you ask him, Lord, what are the standards that I'm living by? What are these standards? What is it that when you're watching social media, you get jealous or, or you feel less than we are? What are the standards? Maybe it is that you don't have a perfect family. So many women are under the bondage of that standard that Jesus Christ has never called you to keep. You let it go. And then you rest under his righteousness. You see, shame is a dictating driver, but Jesus is an inviter. And when we rest under his righteousness, we receive his righteousness. And inside of the So Long to Shame workbook, I'm going to walk you through an exercise that will help you process this through prayer. And the next thing, is that we come in the light and we ask God, is there any sin that I'm holding on to that you want me to be free from? Have you ever wondered why the Bible tells us to confess our sin after we have been forgiven? The truth is you are resting under God's righteousness. But after you are saved, you and I are going to sin. We will make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, confession is a tool from God that we can come to God and say, I need help. I need you to help me. And then instead of trying to cover ourselves with fig leaves, we come in to the light and find freedom. And inside of the workbook materials, I'm going to walk you through a beautiful process and that never forget that confronting shame with courage instead of covering shame flows from you remembering that God is for your freedom. Shame distracts us from intimacy with God. In, this, in these verses, it said Martha was so distracted. And you've got a choice to make. You can sit and listen to Jesus. And ask him, Lord, what are the standards that I'm trying to keep? Lord, what are the messages, the lies that I've received from the wounds that I've been given? Lord, is there any sin and, and negative effects of shame that I am carrying that you want me to be free from? When we exchange our striving for sitting with Jesus, it is the first step to conquer and confront shame. Mary chose what was best. In the light, God's love will meet you there. Shame is not a weight God is calling you to carry. And this is so important 
because you cannot hate yourself and love God and others at the same time. And the first step is being like Mary and choosing to sit at his feet. What will you choose to do today? Never forget, God's love will meet you in the light as you lay down your labor and sit at his feet to listen to him.